being in the middle of nowhere can be downright terrifying. You don't know who could be out there, or what they want to do to you. It's time to get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I was in the mountains of North Carolina for several days. It was a beautiful and peaceful hiking trip with my brother, sister, and their friend Caleb. Being from the Midwest, we had survived two tornadoes. I thought the worst weather event of my life was about to occur, and I was sleeping in a hammock. For those of you who don't know, just before a tornado is formed above your head, every animal in sight will be freaking the hell out. They know. They can feel it. You can feel it too. You just won't know what that new feeling is until the 60-year-old trees beside you are being ripped up from the ground. Being in the eye of the tornado is even more strange, as all those animals in sight are frozen. Sure, they still exist, but their little soul is on hold, and they don't do much more than just look around quietly. It's really creepy. Anyway, this wasn't a tornado at 3am. The fire we made was just embers, and a roaring thunder of animals freaking out. I peeked my head out of my hammock, imagining getting my face smashed in by the first softball-sized hailstone. But no, there was no bad weather. There was no storm or looming catastrophe. It was a beautiful night, aside from the roaring animal kingdom outside. My brother peeks his head out of the hammock above me, and looks down to see if I'm awake. When he saw my eyes as wide as saucers, he whispered, What the hell is happening? I replied, I don't know, but I wish I were up there on your hammock. Being on the ground level usually is best for guys my size. I lack the grace to climb up hammock ropes, and jump into a bed, eight feet off the ground. Anyway, the terrifying creepy roaring continued for about 30 seconds, and then, it just suddenly stopped. It seemed to be a sweeping effect, where the outside of the radius stopped first, and the creatures closer to us stopped last. But it was only a single second or two difference and it was pretty damn synchronized. My brother and I freaked out, and after around five minutes of silence, we got out of the hammock and started the fire up again. This time, we made sure it was big enough to light a few hundred feet out. The last thing we needed is a Bigfoot or some weird shit going down. My brother went up to the ridge to check on my sister and Caleb, about 60 feet uphill from our hammocks. Caleb always wanted to be in the highest possible safe spot he could, and he wanted to watch the sunrise from his hammock. As soon as my brother got to their hammocks, he yelled a shrieking kind of yell for me, the kind I had only heard from him twice, when his friend got his handlebar lodged in his stomach about an inch deep as a kid, and when he split his own head open. I ran up the ridge with my axe in my right hand and the first aid bag in my left, with my flashlight in my teeth, expecting the worst. I arrived to Caleb's bottom bunk. He was in a state of shock, his eyes wide open. He was shivering and shaking, and he was staring down at the valley. Would you know my sister didn't even wake up? Co figure. She had her headphones in all night listening to her folk music. Apparently, she hates the sound of animals and prefers to have a controlled mental state where nothing can make her paranoid. We woke her up and she had no idea what was going on. She just stayed in her hammock, like, well, what do you want me to do? 
We eventually got Caleb down to the fire and wrapped him in some blankets. I gave him a shot of whiskey to sip on, but he mostly just held it and stared at the fire. The whole night was too weird for sleep, but Caleb finally laid down next to the fire and slept around 4.45. But then my brother spotted something strange. What's that, he said, pointing down at the valley. Right there on the bank of the river. My sister and I struggled to get his perspective, but then finally noticed a clearing. We decided to go check it out, but one of us had to stay with Caleb. My sister volunteered as she hates creepy things and didn't want us to go down, but we insisted. I left her my axe an emergency GPS signal thing, and I told her to just scream if she needed us, and not to hesitate to use her pepper spray. She said to stop freaking her out, and just go, and that they'll be there when we get back. So my brother and I hiked down the river. It took us nearly 20 minutes, but when we arrived we felt very uncomfortable. There were no animals around. None whatsoever. No birds, no squirrels, nothing. The clearing on the riverbank was about a hundred yards upstream. We took the higher side of the bank to keep our distance. I didn't think either of us would actually expect anything to go down, but we wanted to remain cautious. We were around 50 yards away, at a slight elevation to the clearing. We pulled out our phones to take a picture, but our phones were dead. Mine is known to die, but I have an external battery pack that attaches to my otter box that I know was fully charged. My brother's phone is always reliable and usually attached to his portable solar panel charger that he keeps on the outside of his bag. His ship was dead too. Both of us tried to hold down our power buttons, not believing that they were really dead. But when we realised that they were definitely not going to turn on, we both got that paranoid look on our faces. We decided to leave, but not before carefully studying the clearing for a few seconds. It was about a hundred feet across, and the shape of a triangle all the bushes and plants that grew alongside the river were all flattened down, and even some mature azalea bushes that typically stand between six and eight feet tall were eerily laying flat. It's as if everything in that triangle shape had bent down, as close to the ground as it could get. Nothing appeared broken, but appeared as if it had grown along the earth instead of growing up towards the sun. It was weird as shit, and only in the triangle area. When we got back to camp, Caleb was awake. My sister had a weird look on her face, and Caleb was totally normal. Hey bro, you alright? My brother asked. Caleb just casually answered, Yeah man, doing well. Missed the sunrise, but I guess I need the sleep. We just looked at him concerned like, what the hell? He was eating a breakfast bar and heating up coffee over the fire. We sat down across from him and I asked him, so hey, do you remember that shit last night? He looked at me puzzled. My brother added, you know when all the animals freaked out and we found you? He just looked so confused. But my sister said, Caleb stop playing. What are you talking about? He said. My brother chimed in. Bro, you were messed up all night. Caleb laughed and responded. Yeah, I figured it had to be me. Because I never sleep next to the fire all wrapped up in blankets. Not after getting that bug in my ear that one time, lol. We continued to ask him questions. But he had no memory whatsoever. As far as he was concerned, he had a few too many drinks and slept next to the fire. We told him our story, and each of us agreed that he had no recollection. We told him about the spot next to the river, and how our phones wouldn't turn on. We pulled our phones out to show him, 
and they were already on. My brother had around 67% and mine had around 41. We got the creeps real quick. We decided to pack up camp and get away from that spot. But before we did a final sweep, Caleb asked, Have you guys seen my camera? He had a nice Sony DSLR with a nice lens. And that shit was gone. The weirdest part is that he slept with it in his hammock every single time he goes camping. And we've never seen it not on his body. He even specifically remembers taking it to bed and tucking it into its bag and putting the lens in its sleeve. It's like a ritual for him and he takes super good care of his belongings. We searched around the ridge and all around the fire and in between the two spots. There was nothing to be found. Caleb even went down to the ridge a bit towards the river in case it had fallen out and rolled down the hill. But it was gone. We had to leave. And my siblings and I agreed to pitch him to get him a new one if he would just get out of there. About three miles and one hour later, my brother turned to me on the trail and said, Do you think he tried to take a picture of some shit he wasn't supposed to see? And the creepiest feeling swept over me. And I replied, Bro, Let's just forget about how messed up he was and get the hell away from there. He nodded in agreement. It's been about a year now. And we haven't seen or heard from Caleb in over eight months. No one has. I'm an archaeologist and a few years back we were doing a massive survey in the middle of nowhere in the interior of BC. All of the crew had gone home and it was just my boss and myself left for a few days to follow up and confirm some coordinates and finish some mapping. We head out from the motel about an hour or so into the bush. We're in the middle of nowhere along deactivated logging roads. The closest town is literally miles away. We hike out to this one area that we had found some stuff in a few weeks previously. Now for some reason, the whole area just felt wrong. I don't know how to describe it really. So anyway, we get down to business and about 15 minutes after being hunched over mapping, there's this weird defining womp sound. I could actually feel the pressure in my ears. I immediately looked at my boss about 20 feet away who was white as a ghost staring back at me. We're both standing now staring at each other and the same thing happens again. Ear pressure and chest pressure felt like it was just squeezed out. There's chills all over my body and every single hair is standing up on end. My boss just looks at me and says, let's go. We grab all of our stuff and speed hike back to the truck. We never discussed it again. I have no clue to this day what it was, but I've been so freaked out that I still haven't forgotten it 10 years later. I still get chills thinking about it now. About 10 years ago, I was working as a private investigator. It sounds cool, but it actually isn't. You spend about three to five hours each day driving to your cases, stake them out in a blazing hot car with the engine off for eight hours, and then spend one to three hours in a hotel room writing up your reports before finally getting some sleep and doing it all over again. I did this job for about a year after completing my training to be a medic in the army reserves. I was young at the time, so the idea of making 50k a year and travelling all over the country whilst living out of a suitcase seemed appealing to 19 year old me. As I said before, you spend a lot of time driving around in areas you're not necessarily familiar with. On one of those late nights, I found myself driving onto a twisting mountain road, just outside of Taos, New Mexico. The area was heavily wooded with narrow roads that curved sharply, without a lot of places to turn off, since you were driving up and around mountains and forests. In the middle of the night, as I manoeuvred my rental vehicle through a curve, I saw a woman stumbling along the side of the road carrying a small child. 
The sight caught me off guard and sent a shiver down my spine. It was so unexpected and so out of place. There were no houses nor buildings around me and it was around 2am and pitch black. This unnerved me, but what sent the shiver down my spine was the way she moved. She lurched along with what I can only describe as a shuffle, straight out of a George Romero zombie flick, and she didn't look up or acknowledge me as I drove by. She just stared aimlessly at the road in front of her. You have to remember that I was 19 years old, and fresh out of a year of extensive army training. I was in peak physical shape, and I thought I was Billy Badass at the time. I had spent a month working in trauma centres as part of my training, so I still don't often get freaked out or scared, but seeing this did scare me. I drove on for a minute or two thinking about what I'd just seen. Who was she? What was she doing here this time of night? How did she get here? The more rational part of my brain took over, and I came to a horrifying realisation. I had been driving for about a mile and a half past her, and I hadn't seen any homes nor businesses, nor had I come across any places to turn off since I had seen her. And it had been about ten miles since I had come across a place to turn before I saw her. This wasn't normal. Something was wrong. I realised that she had to be hurt or in trouble. Perhaps she'd been in a car accident and was in shock. What if the child she was carrying was hurt? I was a medic. I had trained for a year to help people. Sure, I was scared and unnerved. But how would I feel if they later died of exposure out on the mountain and I was too much of a coward to go back and help? Wouldn't I also be scared the first time I saw combat, when my friends were depending on me? I had to man up and turn around. And as soon as it was safe, I did so. I drove back to where I'd seen her, half relieved and half horrified when I could not find her. I traced the road a half a dozen times. Where could she have gone? There was only a small area on the side of the road and guardrails for miles. I drove, turned around and drove, and turned around and drove, and turned around and drove again. I was obsessed with finding her. Part of it was out of concern for her child. Part of it was proving myself that I was doing the right thing, even though I was scared shitless. After a while, however, it became about me proving it to myself that I wasn't actually going insane. I spent hours looking for her. Eventually I stopped my car and started walking along the road, looking for any signs of her or any disturbance on the mountain to indicate that a vehicle had crashed off the road and down a mountain. I walked that entire three mile stretch of road in pitch black with a flashlight, at times yelling like a madman, listening to every twig and echo with bated breath. I didn't even care about my deadline or my next case. I was sure of what I saw. I wasn't crazy. I wasn't seeing things. And I wasn't overly tired. I saw her stumbling down that road. And there's no doubt in my mind. But there was nothing. Even when the sun came up and I drove to the stretch of road again half a dozen times, there was nothing. And there was no way for me to explain it even after countless sleepless nights in the ten years since devoted to it. I don't believe in ghosts. I saw this bullshit documentary and laugh away their evidence and stupid orbs like the rest of you do. But I also don't know where the hell the stumbling woman and her child came from, or where they went. So, on the off chance that you were stumbling down a windy road in Taos, New Mexico about ten years ago with a toddler in your arms, Please, tell me what happened, where you came from, where you went, and that you are both okay. I've been puzzled for a decade now. I was hiking through the remnants of a remote, long abandoned town and the surrounding area. To get as far into the woods that I was, 
you had to cross a fallen tree over a creek three separate times. I had just crossed the third bridge and was about five miles in and something blue caught my eye just ahead of me. There was a man in his late sixties wearing blue satin pajamas sitting in a tree. The closer I got to him, the louder he laughed. It wasn't a maniacal laugh, but it set off alarms in my head nonetheless. He also wasn't wearing any shoes and looked very well groomed slash cleaned. I gave him a friendly nod as I passed and he just kept laughing. Then it stopped. I turned and he was gone. No branches cracked, no plants rustled, no sounds were made. He was just gone. Still rubs me the wrong way. The area I was in was pretty rough, very secluded for hiking. Not very many people venture as deep as I did that day. And I still have no idea what was going on there. I'm going to tell you this story my uncle told me when I was 12. I slept with the lights on for months after. This was in the mid 70s. My uncle and his friend were 13 and playing in a quarry on the outskirts of town. There were mine tracks running up the large hills that then dumped their load down onto the other side of this standard quarrying stuff I assume. So they're climbing up and over all the large hills and notice something in a tree at the edge of the woods. They walk closer and realize it's a young boy hanging by his neck. His arms and legs were tied together behind his back with his left leg free. He was naked and had cuts all over his genitals. There were fresh tire tracks underneath the boy's feet. He said that they heard tires spinning not long before, but they didn't think anything of it. So obviously, he can't know the whole story, but it's his guess that two guys raped and tortured this boy, tied him up in the back of a pickup, and tied the noose around his neck, then drove off. Chilling to think about. We were discussing this at my grandmother's funeral, and he said that he always regretted not going up to the boy to see if he was still alive. Understandably, he and his friends noped out of there immediately and called the police. This story takes place in August of 2013, in the mountains of South Oregon. I am a USAF Security Forces Airman, in other words, a military policeman. My girlfriend was at work, and as a swelteringly hot day began to turn into thunderstorms, my buddy Nick and I decided to go exploring some back roads and get out of the heat in town. South Oregon is crisscrossed with logging roads, some actively used, and many totally forgotten and grown over. Nick and I spent many of our days searching on roads that we knew, finding roads that we did not, and driving for hours into the mountains, eventually navigating back to paved roads. On this particular day, with storm clouds building over the mountains, we set off on a road that we'd never been on before, and began the drive into the mountains. After driving for about an hour, we hadn't seen nor heard any signs of any other people in the woods. We rounded a bend into the thick fir woods and emerged into a meadow that was totally surrounded by thick aspen groves. The meadow was perfectly flat and eerily still. We both noticed the strange stillness almost immediately. No birds hardly any insect noises, no squirrels, and certainly no other people. On the far side of the meadow, right at the edge of the tree line, there was a picnic table. The table was very odd, however. It was painted a bright orange, 
and was much larger than a typical picnic table in a park. Remarking on this, Nick drove through the meadow to get a closer look. I remember being apprehensive as we approached. The whole scenario was exceptionally strange. The overall silence of the Aspen Grove was unsettling. Also, it was nearly impossible to see far into the trees, as aspens grow extremely close together. When we parked by the table, I hopped out the passenger seat of the truck to check it out. I'm not very tall, only about 5 foot 5, but regardless the table was ridiculously oversized and practically unusable. The seats were nearly at chest level, meaning I would have to climb up to even sit on them. As I was looking at the table, Nick called me over to the truck, and I noticed that he was looking back into the Aspens. At first, I couldn't see what he was looking at, but then I noticed a splash of colour that was completely out of place in the thick trees. A small, one-man tent was set back in the trees, about 50 feet away from this strange table. I had an initial feeling of dread hit me, and felt certain that there was someone in that tent, and if we could see the tent, they could undoubtedly see us. There were no campgrounds in the area, no people, no main roads for miles. Surely, someone camping so remote would be, well, at the very least, a strange person. However, as we observed the tent, we didn't see any movement, nor hear any strange sounds coming from it. Nick suggested that I call out. I didn't want to, but I did. Hey, anyone in there? There was no reply. Feeling completely on edge, Nick and I thought about driving away and leaving this strange area. But we began to fear the worst. What if there was a body in that tent? What if somebody had gotten kidnapped? Foolish, I know, but we thought it just the same. After some debate, we decided to have Nick turn the truck around to drive away from the campsite, should there be any need to leave in a hurry. He would be waiting at the wheel, my heart pounding. I started walking through the trees towards the tent. I was totally keyed up, with my senses on full alert. When I reached the campsite, several things struck me as odd. Backpacks were scattered all over, no fire had been built, and no wood collected. The tent, oh the tent, it was literally full of backpacks and women's clothing. Full of dread, I turned to leave to tell Nick what I had seen. As soon as I left, I heard Nick begin to yell, Let's go, let's get out of here! Not knowing what he was yelling about, I ran back to the truck. When I broke out of the trees, I saw a beat-up old Ford Tauros on the road, blocking us from leaving the meadow. I immediately leapt into the passenger seat, and Nick floored the gas pedal. The car was occupied by two men, and the third person was laying against the window of the back seat. As we drove across the meadow, the driver attempted to block us from the road, but Nick drove around them and accelerated the way that we'd come from. I looked back and saw the car attempting to turn around on the narrow road. Nick drove like a madman, and though I was honestly terrified that they would catch up, we hit the highway without seeing the car again. I still don't know if the person in the back was male or female. I called the state police and they promised to send a trooper out to check the scene. I received a call the next day from the trooper, stating that the campsite and the backpacks and all the women's clothing was gone, though he could tell that people had been in the area. The strange table was still by the thick aspen grove, and I have not returned to the area. 
and do not have any intention of doing so again. So as a kid around 11 or 12, I had the world on my fucking plate. We had these woods around us that I never ever came close to finding the edge of. I would wake up in the morning, early, when school was out, and my friend Alex and I would spend the whole day out mucking around those woods. We would pack sandwiches and sodas and just go nuts. Play army and war, cowboys and Indians, you name it. This being the 80s, and Alex and I being smart enough kids, my parents had no problem with this, and enjoyed taking us to the army surplus store to buy stuff like MREs, and survival knives, and camping gear. It was pretty regular that we would be allowed to stay out overnight, if my dad was there to help us set up camp close to the property. So not on an overnight, but out and about one day, we found a tree house in a part of the woods we had never been to before. Probably about a two hour trek from the edge of the neighborhood. Maybe two miles or three. It was hilly and rocky. Seriously a kid's dream. This tree house was probably 30 feet off the ground, but it looked solid. We were so stoked to find our new castle. We hightailed it back home to get some rope, and my pop takes us down to the surplus store. And over dinner, Alex and I can't shut up about it. Next day comes and we hike out at almost dawn. We got a backpack full of rope and sandwiches and our knives on our hips. An excitement that's so thick we could chew on it. We make it out there and start attaching rungs made from big sticks onto one end of the rope. It took us a few good hours, but we got one side finished and the rope tossed over the branch. That's where the little deck and door are. We finally climbed up and are sitting on the deck looking out and rock, paper, scissors for who gets to go in first. Alex wins and goes in and comes right out. He's white as a sheet and wants to go home. So curious as I am, I go inside. This treehouse is probably eight foot by eight foot and about seven, eight feet high inside. The inside walls are covered every single inch of naked girls. Not awesome found playboy porn, but kitty porn. I think the oldest kids were about my age, but it was Polaroids and glossy magazine pages, stuck perfectly up with staples and filling the walls up. Exit Alex and I getting back home as quick as we could. We informed my pops about it, and he calls the cops. The officer shows up and asks us a few questions like where it is, how did we get up there, where did we buy the rope, did we take any pictures off the wall? He got increasingly rude about it and my pops put an end to it. He left with our statement and said he would be in touch. We were no longer allowed to take overnights in the woods or be out there for more than an hour without checking in. We actually built a really long tin can phone with the permission of my parents which allowed us a bit more of our freedom, but we were pretty cut off from the deep exploring. About a year or two later, that same cop stopped me when I was hanging out in a different park, saw me smoking and caught me with the joint. Alex asked him whatever happened with the treehouse. The cop told us to not do drugs and left us alone. In college, many, many moons later, Alex sent me an email, seeing how he read in the big state paper Towns that are, say, the county seat have their own papers, but the capital city has the big paper. That the officer shot himself with his service revolver after his wife found out he was circulating kitty porn. So it comes to my mind like it came to Alex's that we had found his little CP stash cave. And the creepy part came a few months later when Alex sent me another email saying that he went to the estate auction and one of the items for sale was a rope ladder with a bag. Creepiest story I've found in the woods I have, folks. Still grosses me out and sends chills. I knew a guy that spent virtually his entire adult life homeless. He used to wander around all over the country and spent more than his fair share of nights sleeping in the woods with another homeless man. 
who he befriended whilst out on the streets. One morning, he set off into the town early to fetch booze and cigarettes, whilst things were still quiet and not many people were around. His buddy stayed behind in their particular spot of the forest, sleeping. These two guys weren't keen on being disturbed, so they typically went fairly deep into the woods, a good two or so hours walk from the town. It took him a good four hours to get to town, buy his stuff from the offie, and then lug it back to the spot where his friend was. When he finally returned, he found his friend burnt alive inside his charred sleeping bag. In the four hour window that he'd been left to get booze, his friend had been attacked while sleeping in his sleeping bag and was set aflame by someone in the middle of the woods. On a two week solo backpacking trip, I had four days in seclusion between ranger station check-ins. On the first day of the seclusion, I felt like I was being stalked. I lay in my tent that night and I could hear what sounded like footsteps around my camp, but nothing came close. In the morning, I checked all around and found no evidence of footprints or having any wildlife around me. I broke down camp and took off trying to put it behind me. The second night was the same thing. I grew so paranoid that when I couldn't hike during the day, I would go over rocks and walk through streams anything to try and break the trail so that I couldn't be tracked. I'd go around a blind turn and then sit there for an hour, waiting to see if anything would come up behind me. At night I couldn't sleep for more than 10 or 15 minutes before waking up. Finally I got to the ranger station check-in and told them what I had been experiencing. I went and set up camp as close to the station as I could and later the rangers offered me to sleep on their couch for comfort, as I could actually sleep. I accepted and stayed the night indoors. I walked out to my camp in the morning, and it had been destroyed. My tent was cut on the sides, sleeping bag ripped apart and turned inside out. The rangers came to report it, took pictures of everything, and I ended up getting one of the rangers to give me a ride back to base camp so that I could go home the next day. Not sure what was stalking me, but it scares me shitless to this day. When I was about 18, me and some friends took a road trip about 7 or so hours down to the Appalachian National Forest. We were all going to do a little car camping and drink some beers. You know, 18 year old stuff. As such, we didn't want to be bothered by any national park rangers, so we drove way deep into the woods. So eventually we do get there, set up camp, and had some natty lights. And me and a guy decided to go and do a little exploring, so we walked about 100 yards from our site back to the main road. We saw another patch directly across from us. We started walking towards it. Now immediately, we started seeing signs that somebody had lived there for a while. There were big bags of trash, stuff like that. Should have been a huge red flag to turn back, but, you know, we're 18. Eventually, we do manage to reach the site. There's an older white guy who's living out of his van. There's clothing lines strung up all around and coolers placed around it. There's also a big gorgeous dog. I think maybe it's a golden retriever. We tried to back out, but the guy sees us and begins talking to us. To be honest, the guy was friendly enough. He asked us where we're from and things like that. Nothing was too odd at first. He then tells us about some cool spots to check out in the park. We end up chatting for about 10 minutes and going our separate ways. I started to think about how odd it was that this guy had given us directions in step counts and not yards or miles. He was always off balance, not stumbling drunk, but he seemed like he was walking on a balancing beam. He was always swaying side to side. Oh, and he was super excited to talk about the national parks and forests where we're from. Okay, now fast forward two months. Camping's over and we pack our tents. 
Same buddy calls me late at night and tells me to turn on the TV and put the news on. I did oblige. I then see an old dude with a van. You can see exactly where this is heading, but at the time, I didn't. I was just annoyed that my friend had woken me up. No, watch. And then I see the gold retriever and it all clicks to me. What the hell? That man's name was Gary Michael Hilton, convicted of at least four murders. He actually took one of his victims on the same Appalachian Trail we are on, only a few weeks after we left. I used to work security, and several years ago I was assigned to a remote construction site where a summer camp was being built. It was quite literally in the middle of the woods. Roughly four or five miles into the forest with only a single access road that they'd been using to haul equipment and supplies and such. My job was to provide overnight security, doing a foot patrol of the entire area. The patrol covered around two miles roughly once every hour, and then going back to my post, which was a tiny wooden shack not much bigger than a payphone booth to fill up my logs. Other than the occasional black bear, coyote or bobcat, it was a very boring assignment, with one exception. I was doing a routine patrol one night near the end of my shift, around 3am or so. I just passed the gate, where the access road enters the site, when I heard an extremely loud piercing scream that seemed to have come from a distance down the road. It sounded like a woman screaming in absolute terror, and at this point I need to clarify. I hear bobcats pretty often around my house, and encounter them occasionally whilst working in remote areas. They definitely have a distinctive and creepy scream. But there is absolutely no way that this scream was a bobcat. I immediately took off sprinting as fast I could in that direction. I didn't hear anything else after the initial scream, but about a quarter of a mile down or so, I came upon a car parked just off the side of the road. There was no car in sight when I'd come through on my way to my shift, so it had to have been parked there fairly recently not running and with no lights on, and no doors open nor anything. I called out to see if anyone was there, but got no reply. I looked around the general area, and didn't see anything. Needless to say, I was pretty goddamn sketched out at this point. I ran back to my post, and reported what I'd seen to the local police, since there wasn't really anything else I could do. Unfortunately, nothing ever came of it, I've never found out whose scream I heard, or what caused it. The car was apparently owned by a guy who lived in the area, but I never heard why he was there. My supervisor suggested that maybe I'd heard a mountain lion or another animal screaming, but I've heard those animal sounds before, and although they're definitely freaky, there's no mistaking an honest-to-God human scream. I had to attend a family reunion a few years ago. Unfortunately, I really didn't have the money to fly, nor the money to stay in a hotel on the way. So my plan was to drive the entire way and sleep at rest areas in my car. It made sense to me, as it would ensure that I would be able to visit my relatives. It was a three-day trip, so I would be sleeping in the car for at least two nights. I brought along some pillows and blankets so that I could curl up in the back seat. The first night came and went with no incident. I found a rest area and was able to just hang out in the parking lot. The second day of driving, however, had me going through the mountains. I had never made this trip before so I wasn't sure if I would find a rest area. I drove for a very long time, and when my eyes were beginning to close, I figured I would just have to pull out on the side of the road to get a little rest. It was much harder to go to sleep this time, but at least it was quiet and dark. 
very few cars actually came across. I'm not really sure how long I had been asleep for, before I felt something wake me up. I thought my car had moved a bit, but then I assumed it was probably just something I felt when I was sleeping. I closed my eyes, and then I felt it again. My car bobbed up and down a bit. I was afraid. Peeking out from under the blankets, I caught sight of someone standing at the front of my car. He had his foot resting on the bumper, and it was he who was pushing it down with his foot, causing my car to bob. I was about to hide back under the blankets when I looked to the side window and saw a second person there peeking into the side window. I jumped, and when I did, I saw the first guy leave the front of the car and come around to the side window where I was. He viciously tried opening my door, which fortunately was locked, and then started banging on my window. I was completely freaked at this point and decided that the best thing to do would be get into the front seat and start to drive. Right before I started the car though, the first guy succeeded in busting in my window. I yelled, but then quickly pulled away. I have no clue why those guys were antagonizing me, but I did not stop driving until I got to the reunion, and I have never slept in my car again. This happened to myself and a close friend, both 23 year old males, just last month. We decided to go on a two day backpacking camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We are both very comfortable with nature and spend a lot of time camping, hunting, fishing, etc. We hiked about five miles into a small lake and set up camp on a small beach. This was not a heavily trafficked area and we did not expect to run into anyone. Our first night there, as we were sitting around the fire, we saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake around 10.30. This was fairly unusual, however, we did not think too much of it, but as time went on, this flashlight kept moving around the lake, getting closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around in the woods in the middle of the night, and we did not particularly want an unwelcomed guest. Once it was clear that the person or people were heading for our campsite, we moved off into the woods nearby to see who wandered up. I took a small axe with me, and my friend had a .22 rifle. Now, we weren't expecting trouble, and we certainly didn't want to make any, but we figured we might as well cover our bases. Now, the moment of truth, the flashlight comes near the light of our fire, and it is one man. He has a beard, and is probably in his mid-forties. The scary part was, he was carrying what turned out to be a pump-action shotgun. He walked around the campsite a few times, and then proceeded to enter our tent. After rummaging around for a minute or so, he came out and started yelling, I know you're out there. Why don't you come and say hello? My friend and I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. That is when the man proceeded to fire his shotgun into the woods, not too far from where we were. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing we had drying off near the fire and threw them in to burn. My friend, who had aimed his rifle at the man, asked me if he should shoot. I told him absolutely not, unless he spots us and starts pointing the gun in our direction. Thankfully, the man moved off from where we were after a little while. 
We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake, ran out, grabbed everything we could fit in my pack, and took off. It was now around 2 or 3 a.m. We ran out of the trail with flashlights and made it back to my car as the sun was coming up. We immediately went to the police department and reported it, where we also spoke with some forest rangers. And that was it. I haven't heard anything back from the police. It wasn't mysterious. However, it creeps the hell out of both of us. A friend of mine and I were hiking through the woods. It was dark out, and we were beginning to head back towards home. When something came across the path by a fallen tree. It's hard to describe, but it looked like a man in a hooded cloak. It stood, and then slowly and silently moved to a tree and keeled. We couldn't see its face, but we got the feeling that we were being watched. We tried to shrug it off and keep moving. Further down the trail, we saw it again. Being in our early teens, we decided stupidly that we were going to get to the bottom of this. So we started after it, and it started charging. We screamed and it stopped, and then took off into the woods. Feeling brave again, I grabbed a big spear-shaped stick and took off after it. I ran for a bit through the woods until I could see the outline of it once more up ahead through the moonlight. I knelt and watched as another popped up beside it, then another, and then I heard moving to the side of me, realising that whatever these things were, they had surrounded me. I quickly noped out of there in the direction I left my friend, so I know that sounds like the creepy part, but it gets weirder. My friend wasn't there when I'd left him. So I called out to him, and he responded a little away, followed by, You've got to see this. So I followed his voice and came to a clearing. It was bright as hell, and floating around the clearing were legit balls of light, almost like the fairy fountains from The Legend of Zelda. These were pure white light, and we looked at each other, and then hightailed it back to the trail and went home. It was definitely the strangest and scariest thing I've ever witnessed. When I just turned 18, I figured it would be best to move out on my own. It isn't like I had family problems or anything like that, I just really wanted to start my life as an adult. I'd often daydream about throwing crazy parties, being able to hook up without having to find a spot and always having beer in the fridge, and basically just have a ridiculous amount of freedom. So, the summer after high school, I found this small apartment complex on the south side of town. It wasn't anything fancy, 5 apartments to a floor, 3 floors per building and 7 buildings spaced out along a horseshoe spaced road with some woodland surrounding it. My apartment wasn't very big. Now being fresh out of high school and working a super low end job as a waiter I could only afford a small studio apartment. I was fortunate enough to snag one on the 3rd floor so I didn't have to go up any stairs. I planned on going to college but, as some people know, it doesn't always work out that way. After fall and semester started, I still hadn't enrolled. I started doing double shifts at my work to keep myself busy. Living alone in a studio apartment can really take a mental toll on somebody. Seriously, it can. Sitting around all day doing absolutely nothing, waiting to go to work and only really growing older, not to mention, most of my friends ran off to schools out of state and I was the only one left behind. I'm not throwing any parties by myself or for myself, I'm just saying. Anyway, I'd work these doubles all day. They were roughly 10 hour shifts depending on how busy the restaurant was. I'd come back super late at night, way past when the sun went down, walk through the giant horseshoe back to my apartment that sat all the way on the other end. Now at some point in all of this, I realised that college was out of the question for me, so I started saving money for a new car. 
I kept most of my tip money in a large box under my bed and when I'd come home, I'd pull it out, throw the money in and then go and sleep. Well, that was my intention. The problem is, since I'd be working so much and just being a kid, I always wanted to go and get in some personal time by watching television, playing video games or throwing on one of my favourite movies. I'd usually be able to stay up all night by doing it in fact. I'd crush about 4 hours of sleep then wake up, rinse, repeat. After so long, I couldn't really do this anymore, mainly because I had to cancel my cable in order to pay rent, as well as pawn off some of my gaming systems and DVD players. It really sucked for me. Movies and television were my life. I wanted to go to school to study them, but being an adult it always costs a lot. Still, even after I had nothing to do, I still couldn't sleep. <laughs> like some people. I'd stay up all night, smoke a ridiculous amount of cigarettes and just stare out of my window in the middle of the night. Also where I'm from, we get these crazy electrical storms passing from time to time, especially in the late summer or early fall. I just watch those all the time, having nothing to do really open my eyes to my surroundings. In the end I actually got to know all the people who liked to smoke late at night. I knew how many people liked to drive over to Taco Bell past midnight in order to get a snack. I also knew that the entire apartment complex would become a ghost town at around 2 in the morning. There'd be absolutely nothing going on. It'd just be me, either staring out of my window or smoking on my balcony. So one night, I decided to take a walk. I did laps around the horseshoe and listened to an old iPod shuffle. It was also very cold that night, so I wore an old hoodie that I had with the hood up. To be honest, I probably looked extremely suspicious, but honestly, I was just out for a walk. I followed this massive iron fence that wrapped around the entire apartment complex. I was heading back home when I come across something really weird. There was a gate, but it led off into the woods that surrounded the apartment complex. I found it rather weird, I mean, the place was gated, but there was no other place that had a gate on this side of the complex, not to mention that it obviously led to absolutely nowhere. It gave me chills to see that it was open. I just stared off into the howling darkness of the surrounding woodland. I hoped to see if anybody was out there, or maybe find somebody to talk to, just so I could forget about it. I didn't know what to do. I just kept moving. Luckily, I could see the gate from my apartment and decided to play a new game. Who opened the gate? After coming home from work, I placed my tips in the box, went to my window, and stared out and looked for the gate. I could see it from my apartment, luckily. It was just really hard to see. There wasn't any street lights around that damned thing and honestly, it looked like there wasn't even anybody there. This time the gate was shut, and when it shut, it blended into the fence perfectly. Nobody could see it unless they were opening the thing, which I did. I didn't bother to tell anybody because I didn't think it was a big deal. To be honest, I thought somebody was going out there to smoke a bowl or do some weird stuff in the woods, honestly I didn't know. I didn't really care what was going on behind there, but I did need something to pass my hours. So I'm just sitting there on the balcony waiting for things to happen. It's now way past 2am. I'm the only thing awake in this complex as far as I'm concerned, and I'm just smoking away a pack on my times. I then start getting tired and figured out that I'd call it a night, when I suddenly heard a squeaking or creaking sound coming from the iron gate. The metal sounded really rusted. It was way louder from what I remembered a long time ago. I lowered myself down, trying to hide myself amongst the shadows of my balcony. I didn't want to spook whoever it was going into the trees. I squinted my eyes trying to get a good picture. I could then see a shadow moving among the darkness of the tree line, but I soon realised that whoever it was, wasn't coming from the apartment complex. They were going in. My first thought was that maybe it was a person who worked on the other side of the forest and used that as a shortcut through. I never saw it happen before, but... Maybe they discovered a new route or something. Maybe it was one of my neighbours. 
I thought that until my eyes had adjusted properly to the darkness, however. Whoever came from those trees wasn't a person that lived in my complex. They were physically handicapped. I think they were hunched in their back a bit. Their arms swayed back and forth, almost like they were dragging them lifelessly. The knees of this person were also really close to the ground. More than I could possibly imagine somebody still being able to walk with. The movement of the body was just... Haunting. I guess that's the right word. The sight of it alone could stop my heart. I couldn't tell the gender of the person, but they did have medium hair that covered a proportion of their face. The person then moved away from the gate, falling around in a very disturbing manner. They mumbled something to themselves. It was still loud enough that I could hear it. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but to be honest, it sounded like gibberish. I figured out whoever this was was extremely disturbed. I held my breath as I watched the person move from behind the building across from mine towards the one right next to it. They actually stayed away from the street lights that lined the horseshoe shaped drive. They were trying to move through the shadows avoiding detection as much as possible. I didn't even move an inch. I just watched as they started to make their way to a building. As it made its way towards the front of the building, it quickly looked over its shoulder, in doing so, looking right at me. Now I don't know if they saw me, I don't know if they did, but they were pretty far away and it was dark, but I swear to god their eyes widened and they scurried off into the darkness. They didn't stand there, they didn't change anything about their posture, in that weird low walk they entered with and rushed off faster, it was faster than most people could run. I blinked a few times because I didn't believe it at first, but when I heard that gate slam shut, I knew it actually happened. I didn't sleep at all that night. It felt like it was a terrible thing that had happened to me. I had to call in for the morning part of my shift because I was unable to sleep and let them know that I wasn't going to be going in. After the sun came up, I finally went to work. I ended up having to stay late because one of my tables stuck around after we closed and just wanted a few more drinks with the manager. They were friends or something. I did get a $50 tip so I really wasn't complaining. When I got home, I went to stash my money in my box. I opened it up and all of my cash remained, but a note read in some of the worst handwriting I've ever seen. I saw you watching me. My heart stopped. How the hell did they know my room number? How did they get in? I started freaking out and wondered if they were still around. Being a studio apartment, they didn't have a lot of places to hide in, so I quickly checked in my bed, under my bed, in my closet, in my bathroom. They were long gone. I took a peek out my window and saw the gate closed. However, the damn brush of woodland swayed back and forth as if somebody was moving in it. I freaked out and called the police. It took them a bit to get there, and when they did, it seemed like the whole apartment came alive. All the lights came on and everybody's come out to see what the disturbance was. When I told the officers what was going on, they made me feel like I was an idiot. They didn't believe me one bit. I had to then tell them where the gate was, but I didn't go down there because I didn't want to show myself. When they went to look, sure enough, the gate was there. Two then went into the forest to look for this thing, and two of them stayed back with me and got my statements. Eventually, the two officers did come back. When they did, they were powers ghosts. When one of the officers that stayed back with me to take my statement pressured them, they finally opened up. They said they didn't find anybody, but they did find a bunch of personal items hung up in various trees around the forest. They thought it was really weird and they began asking all my neighbours if they were missing anything. Then surely enough, people lined up to go and find that personal items of theirs were missing. Nothing of value. There were pictures inside frames, a hairbrush, books, things like that. Really odd things for somebody to steal. The people at the complex were creeped the hell out. I mean, I saw at least five moving trucks the next week. People just wanted to get out of there and I don't blame them. The owners of the complex came and sealed the gate using a blowtorch. Turns out, 
They had no idea that it was even there in the first place. They didn't put it in. I got out of dodge when I had the chance. I didn't do my nightly routines anymore, but sure as hell, I still couldn't sleep. I left all my lights on and paid my electricity bill and made sure of it. I still couldn't afford to live in that place for much longer anyway. I moved back to the north side of town in a smaller, cheaper apartment complex that wasn't surrounded by woodland. I still have nightmares about all of the things that happen to this day. I live in rural Ohio. One of my friends owns a nice barn and farmhouse out in the sticks, where the buses don't run and where there's absolutely no service. He doesn't actually live there. His family owns the house for shits and giggles. They're millionaires. We'd never ran there before, and it's a pretty scenic wood, so we decided that we'd give it a shot. He and I ran cross country, and our team went to state that year. So we were in really good shape. We get to his barn and plan on running eight miles near a road and then through the woods. We have GPS watches, so we can make our own path and either turn back at four miles or make a looping path if we desire. About two miles off the road, we took a random gravelly road through the woods and there was a hiking path, so we decided to take it. We live in the country, so it isn't really a big deal. We've done this sort of thing before. I've gotten lost in the woods a few times throughout my high school, but we've never done it here and we were so far away from home. I didn't run with my glasses and I'm as blind as a bat. I'm making good pace when all of a sudden I smack into my friend. I look up and he's just standing there. I focus in on what he's looking at, and there are bear traps hanging on a branch right in front of us. Looking around, there's more, all blowing in the breeze like wind chimes. Off in the middle, perched up against a tree, there was something resembling a man. My friend pushed me and told me to run. We didn't say a word until we got back to the main road because we ran so fast. Turns out my friend saw what looked like a bloody scarecrow leaning against a tree. I was good friends with my neighbour and his family when I was a teenager. My neighbour was a youth pastor of a local church. Apparently someone at the church decided to go backpacking in Yosemite National Park. My neighbour had never been backpacking before and he knew that I was an avid backpacker and hiker. So he basically begged me to go with him. I agreed and met his youth group. Jeez, what a bunch of misfits. These kids ranging from 14 to 17, and they were poorly behaved and had some bad attitudes. And one in particular, bragged long and loud about how he would wrestle a bear. We hiked up the mist trail into little Yosmite valleys, which is on the backside of Half Dome. We spent the day hiking in some really nice territory. I didn't much care for my group, but the 19 year old five foot female trail guide was friendly, so it wasn't a total loss. The campsite at LYV is backpacker only, so the site is basically a forested area with a few felled trees which acts as a marker for the different campsites. It was summer, and fair weather so we didn't bring tents. Sleeping out on tarps and sleeping bags, and I was trying to bed down and go to sleep. A couple of the punks in the group thought it would be funny to lob small sticks and stones at me, and I asked them to stop, but these punks just kept laughing and kept it up. It sufficiently pissed me off, and I vowed to get even. I waited until the chatter died off, and the sounds of deep sleep breathing grew around me. The forested campground was pitch black, on a new moon night, and no campfires were allowed. All quiet, 
all around. The only differentiation between the blackness of the surroundings was the velvety purple of the night sky, blazing with a million stars. I crept out of my sleeping bag and crawled on my hands and knees, carefully brushing the forest floor in front of me, clear of needles and twigs, which there were a lot of, so that as I moved I wouldn't make any sounds. I crawled over to the two punks who threw stones at me and found their hiking boots and tossed their boots into the bushes, then crawled back to my sleeping bag silently and went to sleep with a grin on my face. Sleep came quickly after that. I snapped awake some time later, still pitch black inky darkness all around, and everything was completely, totally, eerily silent. I happened to be laying on my side when I awoke, and I completely, no middle groggy ground, just snapped awake from a dead sleep. I could see a narrow sliver of the velvety night sky between the trunks of trees. Right at that moment, a shadow broke the bottom edge of the silver night sky. My breathing froze, and my heartbeat ratched up quickly. So I lay still, totally awake. Staring wide awake into the darkness, straining with all my senses, listening, nothing, silence. I told myself it must have been an owl gliding through the darkness on silent wings, and I closed my eyes and slowed my breathing, trying to go back to sleep. I started to doze off again, when all of a sudden, one of the backpacks in the line of backpacks that were set against the fallen marker log of our campsite began to jiggle. Well, the zipper started jiggling. I froze again, trying to figure out what the heck would be making those zippers jiggle as no other backpack zippers were jiggling. Right then, a 19-year-old 5-foot trail guide flicks on a flashlight. Six inches away, from a brown bear's face. The bear had chomped into the backpack and was doing a full reverse tug to trying to make off with it. But the dead log had snapped limbs and by pulling the bag it had torn the nylon hopelessly and snagged it. It took me a moment to register. There's a bear in camp, six feet to my left. Our trail guide starts yelling at it and hitting it in the face with small stones that she scooped off the forest floor. This woke up the whole camp pretty quickly and someone started blowing one of those ultrasonic whistles. The bear gave up and sprinted out of camp, dodging between tents and shaking its head as if it had bees in its ears. It didn't come back and it turns out the punks who had been throwing stones at me whilst I was trying to get to sleep left a bag of trail mix in his backpack. Dumbass. I hate to talk about it, but I went there too, also alone. I was living in Tokyo a while, and went through this phase of checking out abandoned places, haunted places in straight up strange areas. It wasn't long until I was told of Oakigahara Forest. I made my way out there one spring day. I felt like I was being watched from the moment I stepped into the forest. The silence bothered me. There were no birds, no animals, no insect sounds. Just an eerie silence. I didn't notice this until a slight wind rustled the trees at one point, and I realized it was the first thing I had heard in at least 40 minutes. I walked around for maybe 3 hours total. About an hour and a half in, I started to panic. This silence was deafening. I was convinced there were eyes watching me from all around. It felt like the forest was closing in on me. Almost tunnel vision like. I wasn't disorientated, but I felt unstable. 
I can't really explain it. I saw a tent. It was zip. I didn't want to know what was inside. It was clear it had been there for a while. Beaten by storms and blown around a little. There were pieces of clothing I saw here and there. A shoe. A jacket. A hat. All extremely dirty and untouched. The image burned into my brain is a note nailed to a tree which said, I'm sorry, in Japanese. And that was all. I couldn't walk back to the car park quick enough. The whole way thinking this was a terrible idea. The whole way feeling like something was walking one step behind me. Almost pushing me out of the forest. Just like the OP, I deleted all my photos. I never want to see that place again. Bad juju among those trees. That was nine years ago. Sometimes I dream of it. It's always a nightmare. I live in a compound by myself. I know it sounds wacko, but it's really my tiny home. Workshop, and a couple of other buildings for food, equipment and storage, and a guest room. One bad snowstorm knocked my area OOC. So I decided to hunker in for the long haul. I spent almost two weeks without leaving. Three days in, I get woken up by a knock at the door. I get up to answer it, and halfway there I realise that the only way this guy could knock on my door is if he broke the lock. So I grab my shotgun and ask him through the door who he is and what he wants. The guy says nothing and keeps banging. I go out the back door and sneak around the front and I see a man who's on the ground, covered in blood and shouting for help. Turns out he was driving and crashed and dragged himself five miles down the road until he came to my place. By then, he realised that I forgot to lock the bottom part of my gate and weaseled in. Luckily, he survived. I was out for a long run, probably around about 12 miles on dirt roads through Iowa farmland. Plenty of abandoned barns and old buildings alongside it. As I'm running, I see this figure up ahead walking on the road. It's an old man, fairly well groomed. I could have compared him to anyone. He looked a little bit like Jerry Sandusky, but greyer and with more black in the corners of his mouth than eyes. He was wearing a white sweatsuit and carrying a plastic bag over one shoulder. It looked heavy and full. The man smiled at me, and I smiled back even though physically, I was distancing myself as far away as possible from him. As I passed him, I began to feel dizzy and nauseous. His presence just felt so wrong. His smile was off. I actually had to swallow back vomit that had just began to climb my throat. My adrenaline had gone up, and my pulse was hammering. When I looked back after a couple of meters from distance, he was gone. I have no way to explain this. A group of friends of mine was staying at this remote cabin that one of my friend's cousins owned. There were no roads leading to the cabin, and it was a good three quarters of a day hike from where you parked the cars. I couldn't go at the same time as everyone else, due to work obligations, so I decided to head up the same day, but a little later. It would mean I would have to camp for the night by myself though. I didn't care. I was kind of looking forward to it, as I've never camped alone before. So, I was in the middle of these woods when the sun went down. I got my camp set up in this small clearing, probably 40 feet across. I get my campfire going and pitch my small, one-person tent, doing all that camping stuff like cooking hot dogs on a stick over the fire, and smalls as well. I probably stay up for a good two to three hours after dark. And 
the entire time, I swear I heard shit moving in the woods, on the edge of the clearing. I didn't think anything of it at first, because the woods are full of animals, but as the night went on, I realized that whatever it was, was just circling the clearing over and over. Once I started paying attention to it, it made four or five laps around before I decided to get up and investigate. The noise stopped as soon as I stood up, and I thought I heard some sounds going away through the woods. I just shrugged it off, thinking it was some fox that got curious and then got scared when I stood up. I decide it's time to sleep. I douse the fire and climb into my tent. I start to doze off and stay in that half asleep, half awake state for a while. I normally hear weird shit when I'm in this state. So, I don't think much of it when I hear a voice. Something wakes me all the way up though, and I realize the voice is real and right outside my tent. It's just above a whisper, and I'm not sure if it was another language, or if they were just speaking English in such a way that I couldn't understand. I lay there for some time, I don't know how long, listening and waiting for something to happen. There is just enough moonlight to light up the walls of the tent, so I can see when a hand presses into the wall of my tent, down near my foot. This freaks me out. And I sit up quickly. Whoever was outside of the tent tore us out of there, like running full sprint through the woods. I get out of the tent and shine my flashlight around and see nothing. I was expecting there to be a bloody handprint on the tent, but nope. Didn't sleep that night. Packed up camp at first light that morning and booked it to the cabin. I was in a small bush plane a while ago, for a pretty routine and recreational flight. A longer one. We flew way out of radio range of anything, and there was nothing on the radio at all. Not on any channel. Good weather, but nobody in the air or on the ground in the area, due to how remote and difficult it was to get to and due to it being a small area population-wise as well. Very few people had a plane, and therefore, it never happened that two people with planes were in the same area at once. This is because every pilot knew each other, and we always discussed our flight plans for the future. Completely alone, myself and the pilot, and even though there was the roar of the engine, it was pretty peaceful. The landscape was breathtaking below us, and the sun shone beautifully off the trees. Bored, I scrolled the radio channels receiving only static or nothing, and then it happened. The radio cut out and shut off. Not like no audio, like off, no power, dead. Unsettling as it was, I chalked it up to equipment failure and turned back to the sky. After around 10 seconds, the radio powers on. After around 10 seconds, the radio powers on by itself. And at full volume, in the scariest and raspiest voice you can imagine, a woman screams, help me and then the radio powers off. That shit was as clear as day. The damn sending radio might as well have been in the back seat of the plane. That's how well the signal was picked up. Not a spit of static. Freaked out, I looked at the pilot and said, What the hell was that? And he said, Dude, I have absolutely no idea check the radio. We were simultaneously scanning the ground for signs of life. The signal must have originated somewhere close. So I begin to examine the radio, 
turn the dial off and on. It powers up and goes back to what it was before, picking up very staticky signals from another pilot further off. A few minutes later, those signals sound a bit better and my pilot radios the other and asks about the transmission we heard. Apparently they heard nothing. Later that week the pilots went for beers and my pilot that day asked them all if they had heard something. But they all said nothing. Two days later, a woman was found dead in the wilderness after breaking her leg whilst hiking and starving to death. She did not have a radio with her near her setup, which was close to where they think she broke her leg, as the wound would not have let her walk that well, and the terrain was poor for hiking anyway. We never did find the source, but I try not to think about that day, and I no longer fiddle with the radio anymore when I do flying. Last year, a friend and I went on a long road trip to New Mexico. We camped most of the way, and our first night we got to camp, we spent in the Jefferson National Forest at a campsite in West Virginia. We had found some pamphlets for campsites at a gas station, and we drove out to a place called White Rocks Campground, which was like a 25-plus mile up a dirt road into the mountains. We were in the boonies. On our way in, we saw no cars, except for one truck that was behind us for maybe 15 minutes, but then turned down another road. We passed a huge coal factory with a sign that had said 62 days since an on-site incident. The only people we saw on our drive were standing on the side of the dirt road, huddled around a plastic bin that was on fire. It was all so odd, but we were so excited about camping and being on this trip, we were just laughing about how weird it was, instead of not being worried about having no cell phone reception or being so deep into the mountains. We finally get to the campground, and it's completely empty. Not a single car or person to be seen, and the campground had about 30 sites. We drove around all of them trying to spot anyone, but when we realized it was just us, we picked a random site and decided to just stick it out. We got out of the car and stood there and just listened. The silence was startling. I love being in the woods. I've never felt scared or intimidated to be out there, but there was such a different feeling this time. There were no bird sounds. It was just thick, silent woods. It was getting dark quick, and we decided to start a fire and put up the tent, try to get comfortable. My friend was in charge of the tent, and I was putting together the fire while we were trying to go about our business. We would both just stop and listen. My friend even made the point that if anyone was to approach us, at least there were crunchy leaves everywhere for us to hear it coming. It felt like someone was watching us. It was the first time in my life I've understood what that feeling is. I had goosebumps. I wanted to leave, but I kept my cool for my friend. The fire is started, the tent is up, and the sleeping bags are ready. The sun was set. Sitting around the fire together, the darkness seemed to close in on us now. It felt suffocating. My friend brought out a book to read aloud and made us feel more comfortable. While she was reading, I grabbed my headlamp and would occasionally turn it on and look around me. I had the feeling since we pulled into the campsite that someone was there in the woods. Pitch black, and our fire was a beacon. We decided to go to sleep, but that we would pack up early in the morning 
and get the fuck out of here. We put out the fire, and I decided to grab the one knife we had on us that was still in the car, and kept it beside me in the tent. After getting into our sleeping bags, my friend pulls out her cell phone to see if she had any reception. Nothing. She tried to dial her boyfriend just in case, and I remember saying out loud, We have no reception out here. It won't work. We laid there in the silence, repeatedly watching her phone trying to dial out and then disconnect. Suddenly, about 20 feet off to the left of our tent, footsteps. These weren't footsteps that quietly built up. These were footsteps, like someone had been standing behind the tree near our tent and started walking toward us. The crunchy leaves were doing their job. We froze. We just stared at each other, eyes wide. The footsteps continued to walk toward the tent, then turned to go behind for maybe a couple yards and then stopped. Silence again. Heavy, booted footsteps with the same pattern that would be a person walking, not a bear or a deer. My friend grabbed my knife that was laying by my bag and grabbed her headlamp. Unzips the tent and gets out and stands in front of the tent, knife out, looking around the area. She's a goddamn warrior. It was maybe 45 seconds of silence as we listened for more footsteps or voices. And I could see the light from my friend's headlamp dashing around the trees, but there was nothing there. At this point, she stuck her head back in the tent and said, We're getting the fuck out of here. We then proceeded to, in record time, pack up everything, and in ten minutes we were out of there. I'm amazed about it thinking back on it, how we didn't lose our heads, keeping our cool while we packed, but internally screaming in terror. We only had our headlamps on, and the whole time we were packing up, I kept thinking about how the hill people would grab us and pull us into the darkness, and we would be completely helpless if they did. It didn't feel like it was really happening. Maybe that's why we were almost completely calm while packing. There's no way this is actually happening on our first night camping. We must just be freaking ourselves out. But I still felt like we were being watched. We sped out of there once done. Now here is where the hill people hunting us was confirmed. As we pulled out of the campsite, there were two black, dirty trucks pulled off to the side of the road hidden in the trees, but almost still completely visible. They had definitely not been there when we pulled in earlier, and the closest residential homes were 15 miles away. We didn't see anyone around them, but we didn't stop to look either. We ended up finding a motel and staying the night there, and we proceeded to tell the owner the entire story who was amazingly sweet and comforting. I will remember every detail of that night for the rest of my life. The feeling like we were being watched, hearing the footsteps so closely, so suddenly, and the black trucks of the people who are hunting us. I grew up in a very rural area of the Deep South and spent most of my time riding horses alone in national forests and expensive private properties that bordered our house. There was an old abandoned house, two miles ride through the woods from me. I often rode by it on my journeys through the woods. Sometimes I tied my horse up, went inside and explored. But there was nothing really of interest. There was just trash and things that looked like electricity bills from the 80s. I think an old woman used to live there based on some pictures that I found. Time went on, and I went away to college, 
taking my horse with me. I no longer rode past this abandoned house after graduating my college, and my horse and I moved back home for a little while and I decided to go back to explore the area again. So I rode my horse the two miles through the deep woods to get to this house, which itself is probably a thousand feet from a lonely gravel road that cuts through the forest. It is very secluded and almost creepy. The house is about three miles away from a paved road. I am less brave than I used to be, so when I entered the house I felt out of place and slightly scared. But I used my cell phone light to explore the rooms anyway. A lot was just as I remembered, but right as I was about to leave, I found half a skeletal calf in the corner of the entry room. I have no idea how the calf got shut inside a building. The doors were firmly shut when I approached it, and also the screen door opened one way, so it was impossible for both to be open at once for some creature to accidentally wander in. Furthermore, the nearest cow pastures were a good bit away from the house. I left the abandoned house with the image of my head of some deviant, cruelly trapping a calf in there for sick purposes. I hope I never have to meet the sickos who did that. I went camping with my girlfriend last year. We arrived at the camping site only to see the ranger putting up signs stating that this was the last weekend the campsite was going to be open due to the season ending. That night, we decided to not bother setting up our tent and just stay in the car because it was a lot warmer. The next morning when we woke up, we noticed there was a huge paw print on the back window right above where our heads were. Thankfully, we didn't have any food in the car but it was still creepy as hell finding a bear print. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. Late birthday shout out to Yanina. If you enjoyed today's video, please consider dropping a like and leaving a comment, as it would really help me out. Thanks guys. If you want your story read on my channel, you can submit it as a text post to Reddit, or send it to me via email. Both links can be found in the description. And if you'd like to do something truly amazing today to help support the channel, you now can, via Patreon. You can find the link in the description as well as the links to my social media pages. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.